right. Thank you very much. Well, uh, as mentioned, I'm Jared Walker with Christian Financial Resources. Um, we're at a church extension fund. You'll get to hear a little bit more about us during the next main session. That allows me to get to travel a lot throughout uh, the Midwest, the upper Midwest especially. But I served for years in full-time ministry as a pastor. Uh, while I was in Bible college in Missouri, at the age of 19, I was hired by a church to be their preacher. Now, can you imagine how desperate that church was that they hired a 19-year-old? So it was Bosworth, Missouri. Bosworth Christian Church was looking for a, a preacher. And it was actually a, a disciples church. And it was there in 1995 that I first heard of disciple renewal. In fact, uh, got a copy of the newsletter that was being put out at that time called Disciple Renewal. And uh, after serving different churches in, while I was in college, two different churches in Missouri, I then served nearly 20 years full-time in different roles uh, in churches across the U.S. Children's pastor, family ministries pastor, lead pastor, even a, a church planter. And if you've been in church world very long, you've probably seen examples of compromises of integrity among leaders. <laughs> Uh, just recently, I read about an organization that um, had a big impact on me as a children's pastor and family ministries pastor, and the two um, highest level leaders both recently stepped down at the same time because of an inappropriate relationship. And we hear stories like that all the time. And some of those examples of compromised integrity, they're pretty obvious, they're pretty major ones. And you're probably thinking, yeah, I've, I've, I've got some stories that I've heard about those as well. And so I'm, I'm thankful for this opportunity to facilitate this workshop on integrity in leadership. Because even though I work for a financial organization, here's what I remember about going to conferences as a pastor. The finance workshops, I never went to. I wasn't going to a conference to go to a finance workshop. Uh, and so I wanted to talk about something that I thought would be kind of relevant to everybody in talking about integrity. And I'm going to need a few people to help me out. I've got some scripture references up here, and I need some volunteers to read these when I call them out. So would someone be willing to read Genesis 16, 1 to 4? Just raise your hand. Okay, we, gentlemen in the back, 16, 1 through 4 in Genesis. 1 Samuel 24. The first four verses, would somebody be willing to read that when we get there? All right, Rick, and you're going to stop in the middle of verse four. So 4A, and then uh, somebody who will pick up where Rick leaves off uh, later, 1 Samuel 24, middle of verse four. Okay, perfect. Uh, will somebody take Psalm 19.7, all right, right here, and the last one, Proverbs 25, verses 21 and 22. Somebody take that for us. All right, right here. Okay, so I'll let you know when we are ready for those. Integrity. How would you define the word integrity? Any suggestions? Go ahead and throw out a definition that comes to mind. Integrity. Doing the right thing when nobody's even if nobody's watching. Okay, doing the right thing even if no one is watching, okay? The real deal. The real deal? Good. Morally Strength. and ethically focused. Morally and ethically focused. Strength? Certainly takes strength to maintain integrity, does it? doesn't it? I came across a definition a while back that I really like. It's firm adherence to a code of values. Firm adherence to a code of values. So I've clung to that definition since coming across it. And as people of faith, as Christians, we know that our code of values, it comes from scripture. It comes from the word of God, right? That establishes the code of values to which we hope to uh, adhere firmly. And I think all of us would want to be known as leaders with integrity, people who lead with integrity. But sometimes opportunities to compromise our integrity come disguised as opportunities to do good. Let's unpack that for a little bit. 
Some compromises to our integrity are fairly obvious. That person is not my spouse. If I sleep with that person, that's a compromise of my integrity, right? That's pretty straightforward. But there are more subtle times when an opportunity presents itself that may even look like it's something God orchestrated, God provided. As a church, you're looking to uh, get into a larger facility, expand your facility, an opportunity across town presents itself, but there are some things about the offer that you're not really sure, check out, not sure with the opportunity, but maybe it's what God is providing for us. An opportunity to move forward on what God has promised us or called us to. Well, today we are going to look at two examples in the Old Testament couple of individuals who faced integrity tests. One of them passed the test, the other did not. And so after we look at their examples, we're going to look at some takeaways when it comes to our own integrity. So first, we're going to look at Abraham. Abraham is 75 years old when we pick up the story. God promises Abraham that he's going to be made into a great nation. He shows him the land of Canaan, it says his descendants are going to live in that land. But what's the problem with that promise? No kids, right? Where are those descendants going to come from? Abraham and Sarah, they don't have any children. In Genesis 15, God specifically promises that his heir, Abraham's heir, will be a child of his own flesh and blood. So God promises this to Abraham, promises his descendants will be like the stars in the sky, too numerous to count. Fast forward 10 years later from when God had first made that promise to Abraham. God uh, made that promise. Abraham and Sarah have been waiting 10 years for that promise. It still hasn't happened. Abraham is now 85 years old. And Abraham faces an integrity test. Let's go ahead and read Genesis 16, 1 through 4. Born him no children. It is now. Can you hear me? Okay. I had it turned upside down. Okay. Now Sarai, Abraham's wife, had borne him no children, but she had an Egyptian maidservant named Hagar. So she said to Abram, The Lord has kept me from having children. Go sleep with my maidservant. Perhaps I can build a family through her. Oh, the dumb guy. Abraham agreed to what Sarah said. Sarai. So after Abram had been living in Canaan 10 years, Sarai, his wife, took her Egyptian maidservant Hagar and gave her to her husband to be his wife. He slept with Hagar and she conceived. All right. Thank you. Perfect. So for 10 years, Abraham and Sarah have been waiting for what God had promised. God was the one who promised it. They would have a physical heir. And yet 10 years later, still no kids. They're not getting any younger. And so Sarah presents to Abraham an opportunity to achieve that promise. Abraham, God's promised us this. We've waited on this. We're not the first childless couple. My friends, they've had heirs through their servants. Maybe this is the way that God will provide the heir that he has promised. And you can understand Sarah's thinking, right? God promised it. We've waited for it. Here's an opportunity to grab hold of it. Maybe we should move forward with it. And Abraham fails the test. How often do we sacrifice our integrity in order to pursue something we think maybe God has called us to. Maybe we, we would even call it a God thing. Now, this is conjecture on my part. The Bible doesn't give us a lot of insight into what Sarah is thinking as she makes this proposal. But I would think this has to be a very difficult proposal for her to make. For her to go to Abraham and suggest that he sleep with her servant so that they can have an heir. And I have to wonder if there was a part of Sarah that hoped for a particular answer. 
I wonder if Sarah longed to hear back from Abraham, oh, my sweet Sarah, not for thousand sons would I consider being unfaithful to you. You and no kids is worth more than numerous kids with anybody else. Was that Abraham's response? No, Abraham's response, duh, okay. <laughs> And so they uh, conceive a child. It ends up creating all kinds of strife within the family. And all this tension that actually exists to this day in the nation of Israel or in that region. A lot of the turmoil in the Middle East is between the descendants of Isaac, Abraham and Sarah's child together, and the descendants of Ishmael, Abraham and Hagar's child. And so that tension, because of this integrity compromise, exists still today in the Middle East. But again, we can understand the thinking. God promised it. We've waited for it. Let's grab hold of it. I mentioned I was a, a church planter. In 2011, we started a church in the suburbs of Milwaukee. And for the first 18 months, we met in a high school auditorium. And it was expensive to rent that space. They charged by the hour, and as soon as they opened up the building for us, we started paying $125 an hour uh, to rent the auditorium. We had to rent some other classes for kids' space. We had to hire, pay for the, the custodian that was there to be on site the entire time. And so it cost us over $1,000 a week to rent that space. And nearly every time the school would send us an invoice, there was a mistake on it and almost always in our favor. They would only charge us for an hour when we'd been there for four and a half, or they one time left off a Sunday altogether that we had been there, they just missed us invoicing us that. And I mean, that was, that was $1,000 savings. And as a church plan, it wasn't like we had money everywhere. So opportunities to save, we did want to take advantage of. And when people would hear about those mistakes in billing, sometimes someone would say something like, well, you're not going to bring it to the attention of the school, are you? Or it sounds like God's blessing your church plant with an opportunity to save money. But every time we notified the school to let them know that they billed us incorrectly so that they could adjust it. Well, then one time came when we had rented the school on a Friday night in order to have a movie night, invite families to it. And they had not included that on our invoice for that month. And so I reached out to the district and the contact there said, you know what? We just decided not to charge you for that night. That is how God uses a school district to bless a church plan. Not by us compromising our integrity by failing to point out a mistake that had been made because it was in our favor. Again, oftentimes, opportunities to compromise our integrity, they come disguised as a God thing. An opportunity to move forward towards something that God has promised us. We've looked at Abraham's story. Now we're going to look at David's story. David, his story is connected to conflict with King Saul. Years of conflict has been taking place between King Saul and David. An opportunity comes to put that conflict to rest. Now, David became very close to King Saul. Become, became a trusted comforter to Saul during times of torment. David would play the harp. David was a, a great leader in war for King Saul, winning countless victories. But then Saul became jealous of David. Saul knew God had chosen David to be his successor. And Saul became jealous and wanted David dead. In fact, David had to live among his enemies in order to be protected from Saul. In the middle of that conflict, an opportunity that it looked like maybe God had provided prevent, presented itself. So we're going to pick up 1 Samuel 24. I think, Rick, you had said you were going to read that. After Saul returned from pursuing the Philistines, he was told, David is in the desert of En Gedi. So Saul took 3,000 chosen men from all Israel and set out to look for David and his men near the crags of the wild goats. He came to the sheep pens along the cave, along the way, and a cave was there, and Saul went in to relieve himself. David and his men were far back in the cave. 
The men said, This is the day the Lord spoke of when he said to you, I will give your enemy into your hands for you to deal with as you wish. Perfect. All right. David, God promised it. You've waited for it. Here it is. Grab hold of it. That was the advice of his friends. So David, at this point in his life, he's had some highs and lows. The whole Goliath giant slaying thing, that was pretty cool, right? Getting to be in the king's court, being victorious in battle. Those are all great things. But he knew the biggest day was still to come when he would march into the capital, not as a general or a military leader, but as king to sit on the throne that God had promised. And I have to wonder in those brief moments in the cave, if David ran through his mind what the next few minutes could look like. Can you imagine it? Picture it as if it were a a, a movie. Saul goes into the cave. The army is waiting outside the cave. They start to get restless. What's taking Saul so long? And then someone says, here he comes. Get ready to move out. And so... Soldiers get ready to move. And then someone says, that's not the king. And every eye turns to look at the mouth of the cave. And they see a figure standing there. And then they notice he's holding something in his hand. And he holds it up for everyone to see. And to their horror, initially, it is the head of their king. Then they realize it's David standing there. There's awkward silence for a moment. And then one person shouts out, long live King David. And others join in. And soon the entire army is saying, long live King David. And someone brings Saul's horse up. And David climbs onto the horse and they ride back to the capital. David gets to ascend the throne. God promised it. He waited for it and provided it. Is that how the story plays out? Let's go back into the cave. If I was in David's shoes, I think I'd know what I would probably be tempted to do. Even even his friends are saying, hey, this is a God thing. God's worked it out for you. All right, let's pick up in the middle of verse 4 where we left off. Somebody was going to read that for us. Right here. Microphone's coming. Then David crept up unnoticed and cut off a corner of Saul's robe. Afterward, David was conscious stricken for having cut off a corner of his robe. He said to his men, the Lord forbid that I should do such a thing to my master, the Lord's anointed, or lay my hand on him, for he is the anointed of the Lord. With these words, David sharply rebuked his men and did not allow them to attack Saul. And Saul left the cave and went his way. Then David went out of the cave and called out to Saul, My lord, the king, when Saul looked behind him, David bowed down and prostrated himself with his face to the ground. He said to Saul, Why do you listen when men say, David is bent on harming you? This day you have seen with your own eyes how the Lord delivered you into my hands in the cave. Some urged me to kill you, but I spared you. I said, I will not lay my hand on the Lord, on my Lord, because he is the Lord's anointed. See, my father, look at this piece of your robe in my hand. I cut off the corner of your robe, but did not kill you. See that there is nothing in my hand to indicate that I am guilty of wrongdoing or rebellion. I have not wronged you, but you are hunting me down to take my life. May the Lord judge between you and me, and may the Lord avenge the wrongs you have done to me. But my hand will not touch you. All right, so David refused to kill the king. Because he knew that God had appointed Saul as king when Saul became king. And it wasn't David's job to decide when Saul's time as king was up. In fact, David felt guilty for the fact he'd even cut off the corner of Saul's robe and dishonored him in that way. So the advice of David's friends was, it's a God thing. God's delivered Saul to you for you to put an end to this conflict finally, just as he promised he would. But David's response was, I will not lift my hand against him, for he is the Lord's anointed. So David knew where God eventually wanted him to be. King of Israel, right? 
but he refused to take it upon himself to place himself there. David's approach was this. I know where God wants me to be, but I'm going to wait on his timing to put me there. Wow. I can learn from that. For David, the easy way would have been with the dagger in the back of Saul in that cave. But instead, David chose to wait on God's timing, and it did mean waiting longer. In the moment, what happens immediately after this is Saul does feel bad. Saul leaves David alone, but it's short-lived. And soon Saul is again pursuing David to try and take his life. And David is again finding himself hiding for his very life. Finally, the day did come when Saul's reign as king ended. 1 Samuel 31, we won't take, won't take the time to read it, but in the middle of a, a battle with the Philistines, Saul is critically wounded. He asks his armor bearer to kill him, to finish him off before the Philistines get to him because he was afraid they'll just torture him, make a show of him, and he'd rather just be dead and over with it. And so Saul's reign comes to an end as he dies there on the battlefield. David didn't get to march into the capital with the head of Saul in his hand. But when he did reach the throne as the new king, he could do so knowing he had remained a man of integrity. And that even in the worst part of that nasty conflict with Saul, he clung to what he knew was the right thing to do when he refused to harm the Lord's anointed, the king. So what was it that guided David and guided his hand in that cave? Why did he pass the integrity test when Abraham failed? Well, I need to give credit where it's due. Years ago, I heard Andy Stanley give a talk about David's experience in the cave. And he said that there were three things that guided David in that cave. And so I want to share those three things with you. If we want to maintain lives of integrity, we need to put our opportunities, even the ones that seem like God things, we need to run them through these three tests of integrity. The first one, the law of God. The law of God. In the middle of all the emotion, the fact that he's in the middle of a conflict, the fact that his arch enemy sits there right before him in a very vulnerable position, in the middle of all of that, David was able to discern, regardless the circumstances, I need to honor and obey the law of God. Psalm 19, verse 7. Psalm 19 is a psalm of David. And in verse 7, we see David had a very high regard for the law of God. Who was it who was going to read that for us right here? The law of the Lord is perfect, reviving the soul. The testimony of the Lord is sure, making wise the simple. All right. The law of the Lord is perfect, restoring the soul. David had a high regard for the law of God. So if scripture has spoken on it, that makes it clear. That's what we adhere to. His conscience was stricken even for cutting the corner of Saul's robe. And he said to his men, the Lord forbid that I should do such a thing to my master, the Lord's anointed, or lift my hand against him, for he is the anointed of the Lord. In other words, Saul is king. I know he's king because God put him there, and so I'm not going to take him out of that place. Another principle um, that kind of comes out of that is that when we're trying to make decisions, we need to be careful that we don't replace what God has put in place. We don't replace what God has put in place. In the moment, we can feel like we, we've got a handle on this. We know what needs to be done and we do it. I remember one of my uh, college professors saying in, in ministry, uh, be careful what fences you tear down until you know why they were built in the first place because you might just let loose the raging bull. Be careful tearing something down because what if God was the one who put it there? So we don't replace what God has put in place. All right, uh, another, another uh, integrity test for David. In addition to the law of God, the principles of God. The principles of God, okay? If God has spoken about this, if God has put this leader in place, 
Me taking it upon myself to remove him? That's not a principle I want to adhere to. I understand the law of God. What principles help me to follow the law of God? When David called out to Saul from the mouth of the cave, what did he say? May the Lord judge between you and me. May the Lord avenge the wrongdoings you have done unto me, but my hand will not touch you. He would not bring harm to the Lord's anointed. That was the principle that guided him. And thirdly, the wisdom of God. What was the wise thing for David to do in the cave? Is it wise to become king by putting a knife in the back of the previous king? Did David someday, when he's sitting on his throne and his grandkids come running in and say, Grandpa, Grandpa, tell us the story about how you became king. Did he want to say, well, the previous guy went to the bathroom and I put a knife in his back while he was doing it. How wise is that? The wisdom of God guided David's hand in the cave. Well, I remember a time when I was tempted to compromise my integrity in ministry. Uh, Like David, it was a, a season when I was involved in conflict. Actually, it was at that first little church that I mentioned in Bosworth, Missouri, when I was serving as their preacher. There was a a woman in the church. Uh, We'll call her Mary. And Mary had a reputation for creating a lot of conflict. We'll just put it that way. Kind of had a prickly personality. People would often share stories of how they had had conflict with Mary and Uh, My first several months serving as the preacher of that little church, I actually took pride in the fact that Mary and I got along. We got along pretty well. Well, that all changed like flipping a switch on one day with one decision that was made. The church needed to decide something. They had a congregational vote to do it. Two-thirds of the church voted one way. Mary was in the third that voted a different way. And apparently from Mary's perspective, I was the reason things didn't go the way she wanted. And so instantly that dynamic changed in my relationship with Mary. Mary was a Sunday school teacher. And at that time during the Sunday school hour, you had the older women's class met on this side of the church sanctuary and the older men's class met on this side of the church sanctuary and Mary led the older women's class. So starting that next Sunday, she would come and she would teach her class, but she would leave after Sunday school and not stay for worship because worship was kind of the one hour Jared show because I preached and I led the singing and you know, it is in in a small church. So then after several weeks of that, she got to where she could stay during the singing time. She would stay through offering and communion, but when I stood up to preach, she would also stand up, walk out of the auditorium, slam the door on her way out. It was not a subtle departure. It was, she was making it quite obvious that she was leaving in defiance of the man standing up to preach. During that season, that conflict, it went on for over a year, I would try to be kind to Mary. I would greet her every time I saw her, but she would ignore me. She wouldn't even turn my way to acknowledge that I existed. I would say, good morning, Mary, and she would just walk by. The low point came at a spaghetti dinner. I remember that it was spaghetti. Not that it was held at the church, but at the community center nearby. And again, I've been, I've been trying to do everything I could to be kind to Mary. I would go out of my way to notice something she had done and handwrite her a thank you note. I remember one time she organized a closet. You know, the church closet, everybody throws stuff into, but nobody owns it and organizes it, right? So she organized it, and someone told me that. And so I hand wrote her a thank you note. Mary, thank you for organizing that. I know you probably feel like things you do go unnoticed, but I noticed, and I want to thank you for that. 
continue to try and be as kind to her as possible. And I wish I could say I was motivated by a desire to just try and represent Jesus, just try and show the love of Jesus. Um, I did have a biblical motivation, but it was a little bit different. Um, Proverbs 25, verses 21 and 22, those verses I clung to because they held a promise for me. And remember, remember, God promises it, we wait for it, and then we receive it, okay? So God promises. If your enemy is hungry, give him food to eat. Or her food to eat, right? If she is thirsty, give go. her water to drink. In doing this, you will heap burning coals on her head, and the Lord will reward you. There it is. There's the promise. Every promise is yes and amen. I firmly believed that if I did my part, the enemy's hungry, give her food to eat, she's thirsty, give her water to drink, the reward would come. And I knew what it would look like. It involved tears and an apology, right? And so I clung to it. Someday I would have that day. Now, are you surprised if I say uh, the tearful apology never came? No. The low point at that spaghetti dinner, I had gone through the line. It was at a community center in town, gone through the line, filled my plate sat down at a table, and after I sat down, there was only one spot left at that table. There were other spots around the room, but there was only spot left at that table. And you're probably already going there. Guess who sat in that spot? Mary. Now, I was actually pleased by that. I thought, ah, she's choosing to sit here. She's finally getting over this. And so I turned and I said, hi, Mary. And she turned back and said, oh, I didn't realize where I was sitting. She picked up her plate and she moved to a different table. Now, no one else at that table attended the little church where I was the preacher and Mary attended, but everyone at that table knew I was the preacher of the church that Mary attended. And so the next few minutes was a, were a little bit awkward there. In fact, she left her dessert behind and someone suggested I throw it at her. I did not. I, I actually picked it up and I took it to where she went. And I said, Mary, I think you, you left this behind and took it to her again. I'm, I'm doing my part and literally giving her food to eat. Bring on the burning coals, Lord. <laughs> the opportunity to compromise my integrity came at the end of my days of serving at that little church. I was a college student, as I mentioned, and I needed to complete an internship. And so I was going to be serving overseas that summer, working with missionaries. And so I needed to step down as the preacher of that little church. And uh, they had a, a potluck dinner my last Sunday. I think they were celebrating the fact that like finally we're getting rid of the kid and maybe we can hire somebody who knows what they're doing. So they had this big meal the last Sunday I was there. And uh, Mary pulled me aside and I thought, here it comes. The tearful apology. And in my mind, I had a plan for that day if I didn't get the apology from Mary. I'd rehearsed it in front of the mirror. My last stop in town as I left was going to be at Mary's house because I genuinely believed that her spirit and her attitude was harming the church, holding the church back. And someone needed to confront her with it. And maybe I was the person to do that. And so I practiced it, talked it over with a friend of mine, and thankfully he talked me out of it. So I decided that would not be the last thing I did in town that day. But Mary did pull me aside during the lunch. And I had learned this from other people, but she shared with me then herself, um, even though she had been a widow for many years, she had begun dating uh, an older gentleman. And she shared with me they had decided they wanted to get married. They had even picked out rings. But she went on to share that he had just been given a diagnosis that was terminal that he was in the hospital currently and she didn't think he was going to come home. And then she said, Jared, we would have been honored for you to have done the ceremony. I should have left town that day thanking God for that opportunity. Thank you, Lord, for the reward you provided. But I left town that day going, what was that? After the way she treated me for the last 
year plus? She thinks I would have just said, yeah, I'll do your wedding. Will you talk to me first? It's going to be hard to repeat the vows if you won't even acknowledge that I exist. (laughs) That summer, I mentioned I was going to be working overseas. I got a letter from someone else in the church there. And as part of the letter, they were just kind of providing an update on things in the church. And they mentioned um, that the gentleman Mary had been dating, he had in fact died. And Mary was really struggling with that. And so I figured out with the time difference, would it be a good time to call, uh, call Mary? And so I, I called her and I, I don't remember what all we talked about, but then I offered to pray with her. And as I was praying, I could hear her begin to cry on the other end of the phone. And at the end of the prayer, Mary said, thank you, Jared. I love you. And I said, I love you too, Mary. And I realized that last day in town, when I planned that visit to Mary's house, my integrity hung by just a thread. And me stopping by her house to unload all the stuff that I've prepared would have been like David picking up a dagger in the cave and cutting that last thread of my integrity. I would have cut off any opportunity for me to have that phone call with Mary and pray with her over the phone. That would have been completely eliminated if I'd done that and compromised my integrity. Sometimes we have vengeance in mind, but God has something much more beautiful in store. Compromises of integrity. Sometimes they're obvious. Sometimes they come disguised. Disguised as opportunities to grab onto what God has promised. We just looked at two examples of fathers In our faith, Abraham and David, they both faced opportunities that seemed like a God thing in the moment. One chose the path of integrity, the other didn't. And we're going to face similar choices. And we're going to have to choose. Do we lay aside our character for the sake of progress? Or do we protect our integrity by filtering every opportunity through these three tests? of The law of God, the principles of God, and the wisdom of God. And here's the thing. We chose one example from the life of David. We could have chose a di- chosen a different one where he failed the integrity test. May these three principles guide our hands when we find ourselves in the cave of opportunity. Let's pray together and then we'll take some questions and discuss. Father, thank you for a reminder that Even what seems like it could be a God thing in the moment may actually be a test of our integrity. And Father, we pray that we will cling to your law, to your principles, to your wisdom, to guide our hands in the cave of opportunity. Father, may we not sacrifice our integrity for the sake of what looks like progress. We pray this in Jesus' name.